Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I'm Kayla Conti and I'm the head of Black Media Communications here at Google. I'm very excited to introduce Anna Malika Tubbs, who has written an incredible new book called The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation. What an honor it is to have her here with us, and especially right before Mother's Day. I highly encourage you all to spread the word about this phenomenal book. Buy a copy for yourself, someone in your family, a friend, anyone. She has a goal to sell 5,000 copies this week, so let's help put Anna on the bestsellers list. The Washington Post wrote, this ambitious book reframes African-American history, supplying the female Black experience as a much needed perspective. Anna has many accomplishments. Among them, she holds a master's in multidisciplinary gender studies from University of Cambridge and a bachelor's in medical anthropology from Stanford. Anna is currently a PhD student at Cambridge where her research addresses gender and race issues in the United States with a particular focus on the pervasive erasure of black women. Her husband is the former mayor of Stockton and a former Bold intern. And during her time as first partner, Anna authored the first ever report on the status of women in Stockton. Perhaps most importantly, Anna is a new mother herself, so we'll get into how that has shaped her in writing this book. As you think of questions throughout this conversation, and we really hope you will, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right at any time. We would like to take lots of audience questions. Anna, it's my great honor to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for such a generous introduction. For everybody who's listening, I'm so grateful for your time and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you, I'm so excited to be speaking with you today. Uh, first, can you talk about The Three Mothers, which you dedicated to all the mamas and how the idea for this book first came about? What did you hope to gain by writing it? Definitely. And as we all know, there's obviously so much that goes into any of our accomplishments, whether that's where we're born, who our parents are, you know, our passions and how they're dictated by different experiences. So I'm going to fast forward through a, a few of the motivations <laughs> and start by saying when I started my PhD, I was incredibly inspired by Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read the book, you've probably seen the movie or at least heard of the movie. And I left that work feeling really inspired, but also incredibly angered that this was the first time I'd heard these women's names. Yeah. But this was the first time they'd been shared with me because it wasn't a moment where someone said, oops, we forgot to tell you black women were behind <laughs> space launch that they were the mathematicians that made this possible. It was very right. intentional to erase them from the story because they didn't fit this patriarchal notion of who the heroes and who the leaders should be of our societies, of our communities. And so I started my PhD knowing I'm going to be somebody who finds other hidden figures. I'm going to mm. be someone who addresses the erasure of black women's stories. But that left this wide landscape of options to choose from. Unfortunately, so many of our stories as black women are forgotten, erased, intentionally hidden. So yeah. I thought, okay, I can address several different layers of erasure with one project. So the first one is going to be something that celebrates black women. The second is I thought of the civil rights movement. We mm -hmm. so often come back to it in conversations around policy, obviously this monumental, you know, years where history was happening. And we think now, are we aligning with the vision that our civil rights heroes had for us. Right. And we're gonna keep doing this moving forward. But unfortunately, we speak about this moment in history from such a male perspective. It's a lot easier for us to name male leaders than anybody else, including women and people who are non-binary. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna for sure do something around the civil rights movement. This could be something really epic and changing our conversations, not only now, but for the future. I then thought of our roles in society that are overlooked and mm -hmm. unrecognized and motherhood came to mind immediately. I wasn't a mom yet. Uh, I became a mom while writing the book, but yes. I always have had this reverence for mothers. It's something my mom always taught me. Everywhere that we lived in the world, she would say, think about how women are being treated in this society and in this community. Think very specifically about motherhood. It's like yes. a beginning of life experience. And she believed that everything was intertwined with how we treated motherhood. So if mothers were supported, 
if mothers were protected, if they were doing well, then that society and that community would do well. And that the opposite was also true. If they were not supported, if mm -hmm. they were not given the recognition and the credit that they deserved and the supports that they deserved, then pretty much on every health and wellness indicator, that community would suffer. And I actually right. really agree with my mom. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do something around the mothers of civil rights leaders. The third and final layer that I thought I could address was this binary notion um, that women are the ones who influence their daughters and men are the ones that influence their sons. Mm. This is not true. Parents <laughs> influence their children, people influence each other. And so I knew it would be a great hook to talk about these three men and then in the end, it's still a woman's story. So it's kind of like, gotcha, <laughs> we're not talking about women um, and we're celebrating women's stories. And then finally, finally, it's a long answer, I know, um, <laughs> but all three of these mothers were born within six years of each other. Alberta right. Baldwin, or sorry, Alberta King, Burtis Baldwin and Louise Little. And their famous sons were born within five years of each other. So I could then tell a beautiful story about American history through the eyes of black women. And each chapter is dedicated to 10 years of their lives and 10 years of what's happening in the US. And we're just seeing it develop, but now from their perspective, and it's a completely new way of thinking about things. Yeah, you do an incredible job of weaving together all of their stories. And, and clearly there are three very distinctive different women who have different backgrounds and of different levels of privilege and access, but you you weave their narratives together in a way that makes it feel like they maybe almost knew each other at one point in time and were sort of sharing advice with one another about how to how to raise their sons. So it felt very a very natural connection to be talking about all three of these women in conversation. Um, but what was it specifically that stood out to you about Alberta and Luis and Burtis that made you want to really zero in on, on their lives in particular. Can you give us a bit more of an overview um, so the audience can have a bit of an understanding about their lives? Definitely. When I started writing the book, I was really invested in just telling these women's stories, even before I knew that much about them, really. I just mm -hmm. thought it's going to be interesting. You know, someone asked me, how did you know that their lives were going to be interesting? How did I know that Black women who were born in the early 1900s and who raised these men <laughs> is gonna be interesting. That was an easy choice for me. Right. Um, but so yeah, even before I knew that many facts about them, I was like, I'm gonna tell their stories. I really wanna especially, especially tell who they were before they became mothers, how their passions, how their, what they cared deeply about translated into their motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, so what really surprised me actually the most in this process is that it was really obvious the connection that these women had to their son's works, even long before they were even thinking of having children. So just to give kind of like on paper description of who these women are and were, Alberta King was a religious leader. Her parents were the leaders of Ebenezer Baptist Church. So in history, mm -hmm. we've often said that Ebenezer Baptist is Reverend Martin Luther King Sr.'s church. That's actually completely inaccurate. <laughs> this was Alberta Williams's family's church. She was the daughter of Ebenezer Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, and she believes that faith cannot be faith without social justice, that these things are intertwined, that if you're a religious leader, you fight for the oppressed. If yes. you are somebody who's able to gain privileges like education, that doesn't make you better than anybody else, but instead you use that to contribute to freedom movements. You use that to help move our, our cause forward as a mm -hmm. community. So she believes in participating in marches and boycotts. Her and her parents are some of the first members of the NAACP, some of the very first members. So the only difference really between her kind of philosophy and her son's later is that he calls it nonviolence. But mm. that's like the only difference. Then when we think about Louise Little, who is Malcolm X's mother, yes. she was this radical activist. Like if you're somebody who loves like these like badass activist stories, you have to know Louise, oh, she yeah. was so brave. She believed in black independence above all else, black pride, anti-white assimilation, not depending on your oppressor um, by any means necessary. This was who she was. She even stood up very physically to the KKK when she was pregnant with Malcolm X, mm -hmm. really saying, you know, even if I lose my life, I want my other children who are witnessing me to see what I want them to do in the face of oppression, stand tall and don't ever stop fighting. 
So this is this is Malcolm X's mother. It's so clear yeah. where he gets this kind of courage and bravery from. And then thirdly, Bertis Baldwin is a writer, and she has she lives in the most humble means of the three, um, and constantly is thinking about how we move forward past pain, past hatred, how we find healing, and she helps people in her life through her writing, and mm -hmm. so. Again, her son becomes the famous writer, James Baldwin, who calls himself a witness to the power of light. This is like a direct quote from his mother. And so what really stood out to me, even though I wasn't intending to build these direct connections with the sons, because again, I just thought that their lives were going to be interesting in their own right. right, and they absolutely were, but it made the erasure of them that much clearer. It was intentional. We actually don't know anything about these men without knowing these mother's stories. Yeah, I think it's so true. And 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 when you talk about Luis, I remember very vividly this portion in the book where you're describing how she tried to really educate her sons, you know, and in every facet, whether that was their schooling, but also at home and keeping a dictionary in the kitchen and having them read and look up mm -hmm. words that they either mispronounced or, or didn't know. And I think all between all three women, Alberta and Bertis, including Luis, like education was such a cornerstone of yeah. what they wanted to instill in their children, whether or not they had the full means to give them a proper education. That was really something that they found critical to, to their upbringing. Yeah. Um, what would you say are some other similar characteristics or traits that each of these women had that they were able to raise such strong leaders in these men? Something I cared deeply about in writing this book was actually highlighting their differences because so often when we celebrate black women, well, often we don't celebrate black women, but if we do, we reduce our stories into categories as if we all are the same person. Mm -hmm. And that is just really not accurate. It doesn't represent our community at all. Instead, there's so much strength in our nuance and in our diversity and in our complexity as black women. And it's something that I care deeply about highlighting in each chapter, but there are definitely similar similarities and one that you just brought up. Some of them are very painful similarities. You know, it's sort of like no matter where they were from, no matter yes. their access to privilege, they were still treated very similarly because they were black women. So that's something to really, you know, comment on this intersection of race and gender and all of these things operating against them, no matter what different experiences they had. Um, but other similarities were really beautiful. And one of them that you were mentioning is the way in which they raised their children. And they did it differently. But the mentality around this one in particular saying, we need you to be aware of what's happening mm. in the world. You know, I can't hide you from Jim Crow. I can't hide you from the attacks that are being waged against us. But you are not limited by this. Alberta right. King would say, this is not the natural order of things. She would tell her children this over and over and over again. And there's so many examples in the book where each mom, whether their children are very young or they're grown adults, says to them, this is something that's happening. You know, mm -hmm. this is real. Um, however, not only can you not be limited by it, but you are gonna do something to change it. You're gonna join me in the changing work that I've done, you know, as an activist, as a writer, as an artist, you know, they all were creating life long before they became mothers in the ways in which they were fighting for their communities. They were all activists in their own right. So they say to their children, I'm doing everything in my power to change the systems around mm -hmm. us. And now it's also your turn to do that. But also something that I struggle with with that as a mother of black, well, black son and another child on the way in August. Yay, congratulations. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Is that I want them to know this same thing, but I also don't want them to feel the pressure of mm -hmm. everything falls on you, black people. You need to change the right. world. It's right. all on our shoulders. But instead, they also taught them that we're part of generations of love that have been poured into us, of legacies, of this freedom fight. So we're not alone in this. That also means that we have room to love, to be happy, to relax, to enjoy each other. It's not an individual that's leading everything. And I say this all the time, <clears throat> MLK didn't just like pop out of nowhere on his own. Exactly. There was all this love that was poured into him all this time. Um, because it's also a tool of oppression to make us think that we don't have the space to also enjoy our life if we're committed to social justice, if we're committed to freedom um, and making this vision a reality of all of us being treated with the dignity and respect that we deserve. 
it's a balance. And all three of the moms, although they did it again very differently, this was a common thread in the way that they they raised their children. Yes, I think that's such an important point. I feel like even amongst friends, I've been talking about this idea of you know reclaiming our joy and and really taking care of our minds, our bodies, our spirits as we're navigating you know these complexities and these traumas that we're facing as a society, especially in our black bodies. We have to find that balance, otherwise you just burn out. And if we're all burnt out, you know how are we going to keep making progress? Yeah. Um, but I do want to return to an earlier point that you made, which is you know while there are many things that these women did have in common, mother and especially black motherhood is truly not a monolithic experience. Mm -hmm. um, so how did your perception of what it means to be a black mother change as a result of writing this book and becoming a mother to a young black son yourself? Do you, do you see some of yourself in these three women? Absolutely. I, it was such a gift for me, an honor to be writing about them, to be doing this research and then find myself expecting my firstborn I didn't know he was going to be a boy. We left it a surprise. Nice, <laughs> nice. But I kept thinking, oh, how funny it'll be if I give birth to a son when I'm writing this book about the mothers of sons. Um, and so they comforted me in a lot of ways. On one hand, it's extremely scary uh, when you're a black pregnant woman and you're aware of things like the black maternal health crisis. Mm -hmm. You're aware that there are biases that are still operating against you um, when you're going to seek care. And your immediate thought after being so excited is also incredible fear. And mm -hmm. I was in a way consumed by that for a little bit, but then in writing about these women, I felt this reminder that these circumstances were not inevitable and I didn't have to accept them as my burden um, as a black mom, but instead I needed to focus on the joys. I needed to focus on the fact that I could create change. I needed to focus on the fact that I had agency and I wasn't gonna be conquered. You know, Melissa Harris Perry says, we're not conquered victims, mm. um, but we are constantly responding to any of the attacks that are being waged against us. And so it just empowered me in so many ways. It also reminded me, and I think there's a lot of universal themes for all mothers um, beyond the very unique issues that black mothers face is the notion that many moms feel that we're supposed to be these like selfless robots, mm. that we um, we're, we're congratulated most when we put others ahead of us right. um, and say that our needs no longer matter. And I don't actually think that that is how motherhood should be. I also don't think that everything should fall on that one person um, and we just expect her to balance everything. And then we also don't thank her <laughs> for doing everything, but she is the first that we're gonna blame if something goes wrong. Um, so all of that is wrong. So I think that the book also in learning about these three women, I thought about the, the vulnerability of mothers, the humanity of mothers, and just how powerful it can be to recognize the work that they're doing in and outside of their homes. And I think that that's something that we can all learn from, whether we're mothers or not. But generally going back to something my mom always said, how we treat mothers will matter for all of us. Right. There are benefits for all of us if mothers, and not only biological mothers, all those that are doing mothering work of yes. caretaking, of nourishing others, of educating others, these feminine qualities that for so long have been deemed weaker when in fact they are crucial, essential workers. So many of them are doing mothering work. And so we need to focus on those of us who have the charge of being more community oriented rather than focusing on the individual because it will benefit us as a whole. Yes, 100%. Um, and to that end, I actually, I recently came across an old interview with Toni Morrison, who is one of my favorite authors by far. Um, and she talks about finding freedom in motherhood. And she says, motherhood expanded her understanding of the world and expanded who she was as an artist. Do you think yeah. these three women found freedom in motherhood? And, and have you experienced a new sense of freedom as a mom? Yeah, this is such a good question. It's it's so interesting because I am an academic, but I actually like really hate academia. <laughs> so you all know, the book is very approachable, and I try. I don't get theoretical very often, but right now I'm going to get a little theoretical because all right. in academia, we when we talk about motherhood and maternal theory, a lot of it has been dictated by white feminist thought. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so much of it actually says, you know, like becoming a mother is the reproduction of patriarchy. It's the way in which many women are now being relegated to these um, traditional gender roles. And it's maybe something that we should reject or something that we shouldn't like carry forward. You know, if we're working moms, we shouldn't talk about being mothers, that there's ways in which we're going to be disrespected if that happens, et cetera, et cetera. And all these experiences are are very true for certain people. But there's something very different about black motherhood. Um, and because of the way it's been treated in the United States, because of its relationship with slavery, its relationship with us being the only ones who have legally been deemed the givers of property, not the givers Mm. of life through our children, but the givers of property. So we're being told we are not human. Our children are told they are not human. Um, but because we know that to not be the case, we know that to be the opposite we actually see our children as the beginning of the world starting over every single mm-hmm. time. It's an opportunity to teach liberatory practices, to transform the world around us, to be free. And so it's something that even came up with First Lady Michelle Obama. She said she was mom in chief above all else. Mm-hmm. And so many people, but especially white feminists, were very upset <laughs> that she did this. Mm. feeling like, no, you're setting us back. You are this intelligent, brilliant woman. Like, do, you know, tell us more about the work you're going to do. We don't want to hear about you as a mother. Mm. But for her as a Black mother, this is a revolutionary act to say, I'm going to put my children first. I am going to prioritize their happiness. I'm going to make sure that my work for other people is not being placed above myself and my family. Um, because I see my work and what I'm doing and inspiring them and forming their mind and hopefully shaping more freedom fighters as more important. And so it's just important to understand the context behind that. Um, And it's something that I definitely, I see my motherhood in such power and in such influence. You know, I'm probably like a very funny mom to watch. (laughs) I'm always saying to my husband, like, "Uh, no, nothing could operate in this house without me. Like, it's not like that. (laughs) I'm just going to do it. And you all like, it's okay if I don't get thanks. It's like, no, no, you're going to give me credit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if, like, if my son at any point says something like, oh, I'm so strong because of my dad or like, blah, blah. I'm going to stop him right there. Correct the narrative. Right. Like, I'm very aware of how much I matter as a mother um, because I've studied it so closely. Mm-hmm. And I hope that through my work, more of us can like build that confidence. Um, But it goes beyond mothers. It's not just us saying we have to step into it and then everything's going to be fixed and we're going to be respected. It's, again, systems and policies that need to change so that we more respect the rule. Right. What a timely reminder for for all the dads and dad figures out there who might be celebrating (laughs) their partners for Mother's Day this this coming weekend. Um, Yeah. And I know you mentioned, you know, you you don't like to talk academics too much, but it's very clear when reading the book that this is such a deeply researched piece of work. And you really took the time to really dive deep into the lives of these women. I would love to know a bit more about your writing process. Did you get a chance to interview any of the family members or or have you heard from any of them as this book has been published and, and what has their, their response been? It was a journey. This book was really hard to write um, (laughs) because there was so little information out there about the moms. You know, before this book, you couldn't go to Google and say, hey, who is Louise Little? There just wasn't much information out there Mm. about her. And if there was, it was very, very, you know, reduced as well as taken out of context. So I had to employ so many different methods. Um, Mm. I was reading everything that the sons had written or that had been written about the sons and took any piece of information that I could pull about their moms. Thank God for technology where I can, you know, (laughs) control F (laughs) Louise, control F mom. I didn't have to read these dozens and dozens of works that have been written about the men. Rightfully so. I absolutely think these men are incredible and we need to continue to celebrate them. I'm not trying to replace or erase them in any way, um, but to add to the narrative even more. Um, But yeah, so that's how I sifted through those first. Then I contacted local historians um, in the different places where the women lived Mm -hmm. to see if they could provide more context for me. And then when I was really well prepared, I started reaching out to the families. I knew that it was going to be a big ask for them because they already are inundated by responses. You know, like these are famous families Mm -hmm. um, and they are already exhausted by the fact that they themselves have been erased, you know, by the spotlight that's been shined on this one person. Um, And so in some cases they were like, 
I don't want to be interviewed, but wow. here's, you know, somebody else who you could speak to. So with Alberta King, for instance, I couldn't interview anybody in the family, but they referred me directly to the archival team at the King Center. Right. And therefore, I had a lot that most people just hadn't seen because they hadn't asked to see it, but they mm. had files on Alberta. They just weren't that, all that public quite yet. Um, and then with Luis Little, it was going to some scholars who were experts in Malcolm X, mm -hmm. and they also had boxes of letters to share with me and data and files that, again, had never been published. Um, and then thirdly, Burtis was the hardest one of the three. Mm. Um, but luckily, the family was able to speak with me the most, wow. and I could talk to some of her children and grandchildren, and just hearing that perspective where I could really get an understanding for her essence brought it all together. So it was a lot of creativity, a lot of days where I was <laughs> sifting through so many documents and didn't find anything. Um, but every time I found something, I was just so excited, just like, you know, a little piece of the puzzle. But I should say each paragraph that you read in the book is like five different sources pieced together. Wow. Wow. So I'll give one example of that just to kind of highlight it a little bit. Um, with Bertus Baldwin, for instance, I couldn't take for granted the fact that she would have maybe gone to school. Um, mm -hmm. In the early 1900s, this was incredible, a, a feat to have if you had an above average education, especially as a black woman. Right. And so I asked one of her daughters, you know, I, I was like, I, I hope this is an okay question. But like, do you know, did she go to school? I'm like, was mm -hmm. she educated? And she immediately said, oh, of course, my mom was the most brilliant person I'd ever met. The way she wrote was just mm -hmm. gorgeous. Um, she's like, I don't know where she went to school, but she she had to have. And so I call the local historian, you know, this like old white man <laughs> in Deal Island, Maryland. I'm like, hey, uh, if you, do you have any ideas where she might have been educated? And he goes, well, if she did go to school, there was only one school that a black person could have gone to. And then I researched that school and then I'm able to say, OK, this is where Burtis went to school. But that mm -hmm. so again, just, just saying Burtis went to school took me four different sources of people to confirm that. Wow. Yeah, I could imagine. And and so much of it, to your point, these women haven't been put in context. So not only are you looking for so the sources to cite, but you're looking for like the anecdotes and and all the other supportive information. Yeah. Um, that's that's incredible. Thank you. I will, I will I will say before I move on to the next question, I want to remind the audience uh, to add your questions to the live chat. Uh, we'll be switching over to those questions soon, um, so be sure to get those in. Um, but, but even more on your writing and the style of the book itself, um, it's not. It doesn't read as like a dissertation or or an academic piece of literature. It truly does read like a story. And you you start each chapter with juxtaposing two quotes one from a black perspective and one from that of the white perspective. And you you open the introduction to the book with George Floyd's last words. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mama, I love you, tell the kids I love them, I'm dead. Hmm. And the quotes throughout the book are extremely powerful um, and, and shocking even, even to hear some of the, the words that were spoken by, by people across this country. Why was it important to open with George Floyd? Oh, it it was so hard actually. You know, I mean, in some ways easy to find a lot of these quotes because it wasn't difficult in each of the decades to find somebody who said something horrible about a black <laughs> person. Um, and then of course, like the, again, response and this brilliant way in which black women were continuing to affirm our humanity. So those two quotes are always to, talk about the dehumanization that someone is trying to challenge us with and how black women continue to create life and confirm our humanity and affirm our children's humanity no matter what. So each mm -hmm. quote also corresponds to that decade um, that I'm talking about in the chapter. But the very, very first quote, um, I, as I was writing this book, something that continuously broke my heart but also reminded me of why this book mattered was how relevant it continued to be. That mm -hmm. I was diving deep into these decades of history that are again, recent history, all, um, you know, American history is pretty recent history. I wanted to keep the book as relevant as I could. And I, I kept having to go back up until the day my final edits were due, wow. um, going back and adding in things that were happening. Again, not only these very awful moments, um, again, right. of us witnessing the murder of a black man 
him calling out for his mother, his deceased mother, but still the comfort that he was seeking from her, yes. of someone who loved him and would have protected him or done everything in her power to do so. Um, but also some very inspiring moments. So it's this continuation of a reminder of what black women can do, adding in Stacey Abrams and the win in Georgia mm -hmm. and saying Vice President Kamala Harris that I could write that in my book um, because that was not the case when I started the book by any means. So it was just a constant reminder of me of like, how can I continue to make sure people understand this is not just a celebration of history. This is for us to understand where we are as a nation today and how we move forward, how we address what's happened, the biases that are in our system, the attacks that are still being waged against us, the dehumanization that we are continuing to fight as a black community. And also look at all of the incredible ways black women have done this. Mm -hmm. um, but don't just sit here and admire us. Don't just sit here and admire Alberta King, Bertis Baldwin and Louise Little, but question, why were these challenges in place for them? And why do I, as a black mother, still face several of the same challenges? Right. What do we need to change? And how do we translate admiration into action? How do we correct historical amnesia with a focus on right now? So choosing these last final words, um, George Floyd's final words was saying all of that, this is relevant. This is not just about history. It's about what's happening right now. Yeah, it, it definitely puts things into perspective and, and knowing what we know about what it means to be Black in America and how our mere existence can be deemed as a threat that needs to be controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, as you think about, you know, your position as a mother now, what types of conversations will you have with your son as he, you know, continues to grow up as a Black man in America? Like, will you give him the talk at some point? Will you and your, your husband give him the talk? Yeah, and it's, it's hard. You know, he's only 18 months old. Right. But I will say that we've already had to think about this, which mm -hmm. is so sad and so heartbreaking. But just to give an example of like what mothers of black children are talking about when we say like we aren't only focused on like raising happy children there's also this constant conversation that's happening and fears and attacks that are being you know used against us so when my son was six months old we put him in swim lessons um mm -hmm. so i was a swimmer growing up and i was like you're gonna nice. love swimming yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um he was like really good at it like he was so great at swimming and like any of my friends on instagram could see him you know like floating oh. in the water a little angel um, but this woman who was his teacher said something so strange about him at one point. He was like kicking his mm -hmm. legs, you know, God forbid. And she said, I really hate those angry kicks. He's an angry kid. And we thought, <laughs> what? Wow. You know, like, what? He's six months old. We just started this. Like, wow. what do you mean? And how do you not understand how that's not okay to say about our child? But we wow. were so shocked that it was happening so early in the conversation for us that we literally, even though both my husband and I, as you can tell, have no problem talking about right. social justice and talking about white supremacy. And, you know, we are well aware of how these comments are all connected to each other. We were shocked that we just had a moment of like, we got to sit down and talk about this at home, like because it's it started. It started mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, we are going to have conversations and conversations and conversations about it. But again, trying to find the balance that I think Alberta, Burtis, and Louise reached so beautifully. This is happening. This is real. Um, you are not defined by this. This is the work we've done thus far to change these systems. And like, hopefully, you'll join us in that so that you know the power of your voice. You know that you always have agency. You are not limited by others who have limited myopic mindsets um, and we'll do everything in our power to be right beside you so that it feels more like he's not alone um, and it doesn't all fall on his shoulders. And again, regardless of gender for my second child, I think it's something that all genders, black people have to face. Right. It's not just our sons. And right. Um, we'll just continue to do what we can do. But I, I know how painful that original moment was for me. And mm -hmm. I can only imagine how much harder this is going to get. Yes. But I'll just keep my eyes focused on the possibility for the future. Yeah. And, I, and I've heard you talk about how your mother 
for example, was so passionate about not just women's rights, but children's rights. And, and the, the idea of having to think about that, even at the age of six months for your very own son of what it means to stand up for him and to, to create opportunities for him and to make sure he's both protected, but, but nurtured and has the opportunity to thrive. Um, yeah. You're giving credit to the moms who are doing this work every day through this book, even if you are just focusing on Alberta, Luis and, and Burtis, but how did your own mother shape your perspective growing up? What did she really instill, instill in you? I have such an incredible mom and I think she can be such a powerful example for white allies. My mom is a white woman and she knew that she was, you know, giving birth to children who mm -hmm. were going to be treated differently in this world than she was going to be treated and that they were going to be treated differently than she knew they deserved to be treated. Um, but again, she also, so it was like, she never said to me, Anna, I know what it's going to be like to walk in your shoes. Um, okay. that would have been ridiculous. And she also never said something like, you know, oh, everything's fine. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're all equal. We're all treated the same because how, how terrible and detrimental that could have been to me if my mom is saying this and then I'm walking through the world experiencing things, but I don't understand why. Um, so she was very forward, her and my, my dad both, about what was going on, what we were going to have to face, um, histories behind it. You know, like right. it wasn't just like these removed moments and instances, but instead like why these things happened, even from like a global perspective beyond the United States. Um, and then also saying, but she said, I'll walk right beside you. I'm going to learn mm. right beside you and I will be right beside you and know that you are powerful. You will do anything you want to do in this world. And she 100% day in and day out, not only told me that, but was an example of that. Um, even to the extent of, you know, what she wasn't willing to give up in her own motherhood, you know, that she didn't feel that she needed to stop, you know, talking about her own passions or her own dreams. Um, that was very important to her. Mm -hmm. Even certain times where, you know, she would go on a project abroad for months and like be away from us. So it's not necessarily something that all moms would be like, yeah, that's great. But right. it was something that mattered to my mom that she could still do the work that she cared to do um, and also still be a really good mom. And I think in those moments, she maybe thought she was teaching us something different about mm -hmm. her role um, and what she could inspire and also the sacrifices she was willing to make um, to advance her career, which would be better for all of us as a family. So there's a lot I can say about my mom <laughs> um, and she's absolutely incredible. But the biggest gift I think she gave me and it's something that I even took for granted for a long time. I didn't realize that like people of different races had a hard time like understanding each other till like later. You know, I was I was a little older, even though I was aware of the histories, I was aware of what could happen. It just seemed like it came so easily to her. And mm. we can learn from that. We can learn to say, I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes as a black woman. It's okay right. to say that. Like I don't need anybody to say like, I know what that's like for you. But instead I will walk with you and I will learn and I will be a part of the change and I'll do my part. Right, and I think that last part is so important, right? Being able to self-educate and take on some of that responsibility yourself and the willingness to, to learn and not always you know, burden us to, to teach. That's not always our role to be teachers and sometimes we aren't always good teachers. We're just living our own lives and trying to navigate it as, as best as we can. So I think that's, that's really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned that, you know, she's traveled all over and as have you um, in, your, in your upbringing, you lived in Dubai and Mexico, Sweden, Estonia, Azerbaijan. Like, mm -hmm. I would love to know about, you know, sort of the context that that has influenced on your worldview of having all these exposures to different cultures and diversity of thought, especially at such a young age. It was an incredible privilege that my parents cared deeply about. They wanted us to see the world for ourselves. They, it was even like this like lesson in media literacy, like that you couldn't just believe anything you were seeing on TV, but you mm -hmm. had to like spend the time to learn what you could, whether or not you could travel there yourself, but just to start to say, you know, we're all storytellers, we're telling stories. And right. that doesn't mean it's the one story or it's the one truth. But um, this was a great example for us of, oh, now I understand this better. Or, you know, even a very clear example when I learned about the Mexican-American War in Mexico, mm. like the heroes were very different than, the, than what I learned later when I lived in the United States. So yeah. I was clear from the beginning, it's all just stories. 
And it depends who's in power and who gets yeah. to tell that story and how we can reimagine stories. Um, that's not to take away from like the facts of like violence and things that really happen. I'm not saying that those things are like made up, but how we are learning has to do with those who have the power to say what we're going to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so I was well, well aware of that. Uh, but it also gave me the perspective of I not only recognize difference, but I very much celebrate it. It's something that I'm so comfortable with, but also well aware of, even with you know companies that I might work with, with DEI consulting, I can say the differences that you can bring to a table will always be strengths. We have to stop mm -hmm. being afraid of difference. We have to stop saying, you know, let's all just get along or again, no, you're not treated differently. I don't believe you. <laughs> um, but instead say, what can we learn from the strength of our difference um, and moving past just saying, okay, yeah, we are different, but instead saying, all right, like how has that affected many of us who walk through life differently and are treated differently um, on a daily basis? But also what does that mean in terms of how we can transform our teams, how we mm -hmm. can transform our companies and our nation so uh, it's just something that gave me that that perspective. Yeah, that's great. And and to that point, I have one more question before we transition to audience Q and A. But you you said something that made me think of like the powers in the pen, and you know whoever is the arbiters of the story it gets to dictate how it's being taught and told and shared around the world. And and your research focuses on the pervasive erasure of Black women. Um, do you think the moment that we're in right now with things like Black Lives Matter and the 1619 Project and the push for more representation in media, et cetera, is that helping to reframe this conversation and make sure stories are, are not forgotten or rewritten for that matter? It's because of these voices that I even had a chance of writing this book. You know, there has always been a group of people, um, whether they knew each other or were spread <laughs> throughout the world, who have said, no, no, that is not the story. That is not the case. It's actually something that in Ghana, so my dad's Ghanaian, mm. um, like every family in Ghana has like a family historian who knows the oral history of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so beautiful because they will always like have this record in their minds of like mm -hmm. you know, how things went. Um, so it's a, it's a very ancient tradition of saying, this is our story right. and it won't be forgotten no matter how much try, people try to erase us from that or maybe take it away from us or say something different happened. Um, so I definitely, I think I'm part of a long legacy of that. Um, writing has been something that I've just always loved doing and even when I was a kid, my parents would say, like, you have a power to write. It's mm -hmm. something that you, you can do really well. And from all these experiences of being around all these different people, you can bring people together through your work and through your yeah. writing. And so it's an honor for me that I, I think all of us are contributing very differently to freedom movements. Um, and I see this as, as a part of my contribution. Amazing. Well, we do have some audience questions, so I want to make sure we can get to those before our time is up today. So maybe we can take the first audience question. Um, Girma Goyal, uh, what are some of the teachings the mothers provided their children that stood out to you? There are some that are very, you know, like tangible, like actions that they took and others that are much more like philosophy and theology. So I'll answer this by saying some of the examples that I thought were just you know, I could repeat <laughs> if anybody wanted to repeat in their own homes. Um, Louis Little, for instance, it's something that you mentioned a little bit earlier, Kayla, but it was how she wanted to always know what her kids were learning mm -hmm. outside of her home. So whenever they came back from school, they would sit at their table um, and they would tell her what they'd talked about at school. And she might reteach them some things if she mm -hmm. felt that they needed <laughs> a different perspective um, or that somebody was saying something that would be hurtful to them or make them think that they were any less than they were. Right. Um, and then she also was ready every day with newspaper clippings that she wanted her kids to read from three papers around the world that were speaking about black freedom movements so that they had a global perspective on what was happening. Louise Little was like bi like trilingual, multilingual. Um, she was born in Grenada and then moved to Montreal, Canada as an activist. Mm, yeah. And so all of these things really mattered to her that they know um, her history as well. 
But they would read these articles out loud. And if they ever stumbled on any of the words, there was also a dictionary on the table mm -hmm. that they had to go to learn the new word and then come back to the article and continue to read it. And I just think that's really powerful. I think it's super cool to not only be so engaged in conversation around what they're learning when they're not with you, um, because you never know how yes. someone might be trying to harm them outside of you, or even just thinking, oh, great, let's be in conversation about that. Um, and then the kids at school thinking, oh, I'm going to tell mom about this when I get <laughs> home. And then saying, here's also more school, but in a way that we enjoy right. it as a family. And if you don't know something, here's a way that you can find something out. And this like practice of you can always advance your own education, which I think is just really awesome. So that's one of the stories that stands out to me. I love that. And we'll take our next question from the audience. We have Mike. Uh, while you were researching the three mothers, how did they deal with the fear or concern of their son's safety in a society that at times wasn't ready for social and economic systems to be challenged? Great question. Definitely a great question. And it came up a lot. I would say first and foremost, the mothers didn't hide their fear. Um, they were very upfront with their family, with their loved ones, with their children. I am afraid. I'm mm -hmm. afraid of what might happen to you. I'm afraid that, you know, I don't know what this is going to cost you, but also I'm not going to stand in your way. But to think of the struggle, like the, the tug of war for these moms who have said from the beginning of their children's lives, here's how we can inspire change. Here are mm -hmm. tactics that we've used for generations in our family. You know, these are things I'm passing on to you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all of their children in all their ways were involved in freedom movements. Um, Luis Little had eight children. Bertus Baldwin had nine children. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. My <laughs> it's word. <really> incredible. <laughs> exactly. Alberta King had three children. Um, so all of them had many children and they were in their own ways, you know, kind mm -hmm. of joining um, the fight or giving their own contributions. But these three famous, or three sons that are now becoming, you know, well known around the world and in their early twenties, like they, right. they were young, very young, um, very very young. But it was really fearful for them. Like it was very scary for the moms. Um, you know, even after they said this is what you should do, and then it's like, okay, it's happening. But also all of these, you know, threats now are, are um, being waged against them and they have to face that day in and day out. Um, so it was this balance, again, of saying not being, you know, like robots and not saying, oh, it, you know, it's great. You're fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you keep doing it. Still acknowledging their children's humanity and the fact that they were their sons, their yeah. babies. Yeah. Um, but also saying, I'm not going to stand in your way. You're yeah. doing what I taught you to do. And I'm proud of you but I'm also scared, yeah. um, especially Alberta King is an example of somebody who constantly voices her fear um, and constantly says, I think something's going to happen to yeah. my children. Yeah, I've heard from my mom and a lot of other mother figures in my life. They're like, anytime you walk out the door, I don't breathe and I don't exhale until you walk back in that door. And I know <laughs> you're in the house. So and I am by no means anywhere near as important of any of these three figures, but I can imagine that that sense of holding your breath and, and having to wait uh, for for their sons to come back home safely. Was, well, especially was I mean, in these three cases too. I mean, it's like, yeah, definitely I agree that like we, it's such a crazy experience <laughs> with motherhood and you're just like, ah, I'm like so afraid all the time. Like, I've, I don't think I'm ever going to like sleep the same again. Yeah. I'm always like, if he's like sleeping through the night, I'm like, why is he, is he okay? Like, what's going on? And right. he's like totally fine. And he's like sleeping. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like checking the monitor over and over again. Um, you have these fears, but especially like you think with like MLK Jr. And, you know, he gets like stabbed with a pen because he's like at like an, he's like signing, you know, um, books and then he's arrested and then he's like beaten by somebody else and then someone's on TV bragging about the fact that right. they attacked you know MLK Jr. Same with Malcolm X like these constant public and private threats were going to kill you his house is firebombed you know same with James Baldwin the fact that this was a black man who was speaking so powerfully on radio and on TV and was like traveling around the world, any space that he walked into was dangerous for him. Mm -hmm. um, and so the moms are also witnessing that and hearing that. And I got, I can't, I can't even imagine, but there was something in them that constantly reminded them their kids were doing the work that they taught them to do. 
Right, right. And I think we have one more lined up as well from Farah. Uh, thank you, Anna, for coming today. What was an aha moment or something you were amazed by while you were writing the book? So many aha moments. <laughs> Anytime that I found like any fact about the women was like, a, yes, I did it. Like there was something else than like a piece of the puzzle. I had actually these like poster boards that I put all over my walls. It was like kind of funny. I was like, it's my own little investigator and like mm -hmm. had these post-its where I would like fill in the timeline. And anytime I got to put a post-it up, it was an aha moment. Nice. But for instance, one of the things, um, I'll give one for each woman. I think I can do that pretty quickly. We'll see how it goes. Virgil <laughs> Baldwin, uh, I was reading something that had been written about Baldwin and there was this short paragraph, but it was so beautiful of one of James Baldwin's principles saying um, that he clearly inherited his writing talent from his mother. Mm -hmm. And he, she could see that based off of the letters that she wrote to excuse any of his absences. That was yeah. just like, whoa. Okay, first of all, how do you write a great letter excusing no. an absence? <laughs> Pretty straightforward in my mind, but maybe not. <laughs> that someone would say he clearly inherited his writing from his mother. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I just love that. It was like such a simple thing, but like a yes, okay, yes, this is this is it. I'm I'm on to something. And then with Alberta King, you know, this one isn't like an aha moment, but a moment where it was like again like crazy that we didn't know her story. She mm -hmm. herself was assassinated in her church. She was shot in the back right. when she was playing the organ. Um, and like that should be a known fact. We should honor her life and think about the tragedy of what led to that as well. Yes. Um, and then for Louise Little, again, maybe not like an aha, but something that we should all be aware of in history, We've said that she quote unquote went crazy. This is what a lot of people have said. If you know anything about mm -hmm. Malcolm or like if you're a close fan of Malcolm X, you probably heard his mom went crazy and this is why he was taken from her. But the context behind this, as we all know now, she was this activist. She stood up for herself um, and not everybody liked that, of course. So her and her husband are being persecuted constantly by the KKK and another group called the Black Legion. Mm -hmm. um, her husband is murdered. And this is after their house is burned down, then her husband is murdered. And then she is told that his murder is an accident or that he committed suicide. So she's not given the supports that she needs. And she has eight children, as I mentioned, she's in her thirties. And she's still trying to fight for herself and for her agency and practice her self-sufficiency. So when welfare workers are coming to her home, which was actually very invasive for her, right. um, she's saying, no, like, I don't want this. I know what I'm doing, I'm okay. And she very much and very likely was probably experiencing some form of depression. Mm -hmm. um, but a white male doctor comes in and diagnoses her with dementia by saying, and this is verbatim, I have the doctor's note in the book, saying she is imagining being discriminated against. And this is enough to Ooh. put her away in an institution against her will for 25 years wow. of her life. How do we not know that fact in history, first of all? And secondly, how awful that now if somebody tells a story, they just say she went crazy and her kids were taken away from her. Right, that's erasure, a clear yes. example of erasure. Yes. Um, the wow. book is filled with those. So there's yes. a there for those <laughs> that haven't read it yet. Yes, I think we actually had one more question come through. So let's see what that is. V. Nicoles, um, we have great to see you two beautiful women using their energy in this way. Thank Curious you. what you learned about how Martin, Malcolm and James themselves acknowledged the influence of their mothers in their work. Such a good question. And that was actually something that also surprised me because I thought, mm -hmm. okay, you know, like how are the sons? How did they contribute to the erasure of their mothers? Um, but in fact, what I found was so many moments where the sons say, this is my mom that taught me this. This is because mm -hmm. of her. Mm -hmm. And so again, it became the erasure was very intentional on the part of historians and scholars and anybody who was interviewing the sons um, because it again, just didn't fit what they felt like the story should be. Right. And I've experienced this even on a personal level. So for those that have heard of my husband, who's, you know, was mayor of Stockton, very involved with UBI, et cetera. Um, I, he would often be interviewed and he would talk about the black women in his life. He would say, 
my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, my wife. Mm -hmm. They are crucial in my journey. And then this interview will come out later and we're like maybe like a little tiny part of it, even if he spoke about us for quite a long time. (laughs) And then they'll write this long paragraph about his dad who hasn't been Mm -hmm. part of his life. Um, And we can say all we need to say actually about the ills of mass incarceration and why his father was taken away from him. But when we're talking about influence on his life, how are we still speaking about the person that wasn't there, but when he mentions who was there, Mm -hmm. we're still flipping the narrative. Okay, so this is something that I was, again, very keenly aware of. So when I started my work on this book, and then I started to see that all three sons, so MLK Jr., if you now go back and read some of his works, you'll start to notice more how he's saying, this is my mom's work, or he Mm -hmm. he would write her these letters that I include in the book where he's like, mother, dear, you're the best mom in the world. And he's like asking her for little things. Like he's like, can you send me my brown shoes? Like I need them. He's like, will you send me some some of the chicken that you cook for me? That's what I like. He's like this sweet little boy. And he's always saying like, I learned this from my mom. And I tell everybody around me, you know, my parents were the best parents in the world. And my Mm -hmm. mom taught me all of these things. He was also incredibly close to his grandmother. Um, So that actually comes up a lot in his writing. So we just haven't paid that much attention to it. Um, Then we have Malcolm X, who was, again, taken from his mom at such a young age. But if you read in the autobiography, if you go a little bit more into like his reflections at the very end, he actually speaks about being reunited with her um, and what it meant for him to see her after 25 years that Mm -hmm. she'd been taken from him. And he even says... When he's in prison and, you know, he's lived his Detroit red life and now he's, you know, deciding if he's going to convert to the nation. One, he says to his brother in a letter, mom was the first one to teach us these things. Right. All of our accomplishments are moms. These are his direct words. And then he also says his brother reminds him, remember what mom used to do. Remember what mom taught us. And this is why Malcolm X pulls out a dictionary and starts writing word for word, word for word from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. It's not because he just thought that'd be a good idea, but instead he's returning to his mom. And I find that to be so beautiful. beautiful. And then finally, James Baldwin and Burtis Baldwin, probably the most obvious example actually of the three. He despised his stepfather. Um, He was abusive. He just really had so many really bad things to say about him. So that's why we often hear a lot more about the stepfather because of James Baldwin's criticism of him. But at the same time, there's actually always a moment where he balances that out by talking about his mother's love for him, even in Notes of a Native Son, you know, the fire next time. Burtis is mentioned in all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, He has poet poems that he dedicates to her. If he can't ever make it back, you know, to the U.S. to accept an award, she accepts them Mm -hmm. on his behalf. And even the final thing, um, which will be a good probably note to end with, when he passed away, so all of the moms tragically outlive their famous sons. Um, But when James Baldwin passes away, one of his dying wishes is that he'll be buried, that his mom will be buried next to him when it's Mm -hmm. her turn. And he's aware, he's lived longer than MLK and Malcolm X. He's aware of the influence he's had on the world. He knows people are going to come and probably try to visit him or honor him. Mm -hmm. And he says with this final statement, if you're going to come and honor me, you have to honor my mother. And they have a shared plaque. It says Baldwin in the middle, Mm -hmm. James in one corner, and Burtis in the other. And it's just a beautiful testament to his awareness of who he was because of her. Yeah. It's beautiful. That I agree. That, that's perfect. Um, I do have one. <laughs> yes, I do have one more question before we let you go today, though. Um, now that you have this first book under your belt, and again, please, everyone, go out and and purchase this book and and read and absorb the text for yourself. Um, do you want to write another one? Have you already started oh, thinking yeah. about what you would would write about next? Yeah, I've actually been working on a novel for like five years, wow. longer than I've been working on this first book. <laughs> But it's funny when you try to sell a fiction versus a nonfiction, this is more of a technical thing. But with a nonfiction, you write a proposal. And if you write a great proposal, then you can sell it. And then you work on the book after you sold it. With Mm -hmm. fiction, it has to be like a perfect book pretty much before Mm -hmm. you sell it. And that's how I actually met my agent, who is wonderful, Julia Carden. And she read my, my novel that I was working on. Um, was very early draft. So like kudos to her for believing in me. But she was like, this is brilliant. It's going to be great. 
but it's not ready. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have something else that you're working on? And I said, oh, well, I'm like in a PhD program. I'm writing about these three women. And wow. she was like, that's okay. it. That's the one. That's the yeah. first book you're going to sell. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of excited, a lot of projects that I'm excited about. Um, and I'm also working on a picture book for kiddos around oh. the mothers of influential black women. And yeah, those, hopefully the ideas just keep coming. I'm excited to keep it, keep it up. I'm living the dream. Uh, well, congratulations. And we'll be keeping our eyes out for these next bodies of work. Um, that's so exciting. Thank You've you. given us so much to think about today, Anna. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us and for writing uh, this important book. I, I want to wish you and all the mothers who are out there watching us today a very happy Mother's Day. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for happy being Mother's here. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Kayla. The questions were amazing. And thank, thank you for the audience questions as well. Thank you. Thank you for being with us at Google today. Thank you, Anna.